Cerebral venous sinus thrombosis is the formation of a clot within the dural venous sinuses, which are involved in draining blood from the brain. We'll take a quick look at the anatomy. First, we have the superior sagittal sinus, which runs from the frontal lobe all the way back to the internal occipital protuberance. We also have the inferior sagittal sinus, which is situated deeper than its superior counterpart and drains into the straight sinus. The straight sinus and superior sagittal sinus join at the confluence of sinuses, found at the internal occipital protuberance. This confluence of sinuses also has the occipital sinus draining into it. From here, there are the transverse sinuses on both sides, which each continue along the occipital bone and into the sigmoid sinuses, before finally becoming the internal jugular veins. For completeness, there are also the cavernous sinuses, found on each side of the cella turcica, and these receive blood from the ophthalmic veins, the hypophyseal vein, and sphenoparietal sinuses. From here, the blood moves into the superior and inferior petrosal sinuses, and then ultimately into the internal jugular veins. The most common locations for a thrombus to form are the superior sagittal sinus, the transverse sinuses, and the sigmoid sinus. Remember as well that most patients actually have multiple sinuses involved. The most common manifestation of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis is a headache, which is seen in 80 to 90% of patients. These are mostly acute headaches that worsen over a few days and that may present as many different headache types and locations. But when the sigmoid sinus is involved, there is a correlation with occipital and neck pain. Occasionally, the headache can develop as a thunderclap headache, but this finding is typically more suggestive of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Chronic headaches as a presentation are less common. Overall, in 40% of cases, a headache is the only symptom. Seizures are also a common feature in cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, with some sources quoting as many as 46% of patients experiencing them. The most common seizures were generalized tonic-clonic seizures, followed by focal with secondary generalized, more recently called focal to bilateral seizures, and finally focal seizures. Status epilepticus was seen in between 5 and 15% of patients. Next, we have focal neurological deficits. Most commonly, these are motor deficits with a sudden onset, although not as sudden as in arterial ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke. Speech disturbances such as aphasia may also be seen, especially when the left transverse sinus is involved. Cranial nerve deficits may also be present and may involve multiple cranial nerves. Ocular motor palsy, which is cranial nerve 3, or palsy of cranial nerves 4 and 6 can all result in diplopia, which is double vision. Involvement of the trigeminal nerve or cranial nerve 5 can give trigeminal neuralgia, and with involvement of the facial nerve, which is cranial nerve 7, there can be a facial paralysis. Typically, this is a peripheral facial palsy, also known as a lower motor neuron pattern, where there is involvement of the entire one side of the face, rather than only the lower one third, as is seen in upper motor neuron lesions, such as strokes. Papilledema is seen in between 30 and 60% of patients, and this is a swelling of the optic disc at the back of the eyes and is usually the result of a raised intracranial pressure. It may also cause associated vision loss, but vision loss can also be caused by cerebral infarction, which most commonly is a bilateral homonymous hemianopia, which may manifest as total blindness. This, in most cases, is somewhat reversible. Patients may also present with a reduced level of consciousness, measured with the Glasgow Coma Scale, and this is seen in around one-third of patients. Those who present with an altered conscious level typically have a worse outcome compared to those who do not have altered consciousness levels. Patients may experience nausea and vomiting, and in some instances, the presentation may be psychological, such as abulia, which is the lack of motivation or the inability to take decisive action, or even amnesia. It is estimated that 85% of patients who have cerebral venous sinus thrombosis will have at least one risk factor. 
These include inherited causes such as thrombophilia states resulting from abnormalities in coagulation. These are conditions like factor V laden or deficiencies in protein C, protein S, or antithrombin. Acquired prothrombotic states include the use of the oral contraceptive pill containing estrogen or even being pregnant or postpartum. Antiphospholipid syndrome has also been found to be a cause for cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. Others include infection, neoplasm, dehydration, chronic inflammatory conditions like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, and even lupus. Anemia has also been identified as a risk factor, as has head trauma involving the sinuses. As for the diagnosis, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis may be suspected from the clinical picture. However, neuroimaging will be needed to confirm the diagnosis. Non-contrast CT is typically the first modality used, especially if there is any suspicion of stroke. In 30% of cases, the unenhanced CT is normal. Some abnormalities like the dense triangle sign or cord sign may be seen or even areas of ischemia but these changes are not specific. Therefore, further imaging is needed. This is usually either CT or MR venography. The mainstay of treatment is low molecular weight heparin, typically as two divided doses per 24 hours. Longer term anticoagulation is also used to prevent future thrombotic events. Often this is warfarin, lasting between three and 12 months. If an individual has had two or more episodes, then they will likely require lifelong anticoagulation. The evidence for direct oral anticoagulants is at the moment limited, with studies suggesting safety and efficacy. However, further trials are needed to validate the findings and to determine the optimal regimens.